Hello again, so chapter two. So I hope you enjoyed chapter one yesterday. Um, so chapter two then, with the prince disappearing into the distance on the boat. Not that he's going through the gump, but we'll have to wait and see, won't we? Chapter two. Mrs Trottle was rich. She was so rich that she had 11 winter coats and five diamond necklaces and her bath had golden taps. Mr Trottle, her husband, was a banker and spent his days lending money to people who already had too much of it and refusing to lend it to people who needed it. The house the Trottles lived in was in the best part of London, beside a beautiful park and not far from Buckingham Palace. It had an ordinary address, but the tradesmen called it Trottle Towers because of the spiky railings that surrounded it and the statues in the garden and the flagpole. Although Lorena Trotter was perfectly strong and well and Landon Trottle kept fit by hiring a man to pummel him in his private gym, the Trottles had no less than five servants to wait on them. A butler, a cook, a chauffeur, a housemaid and a gardener. They had three cars and seven portable telephones which Mr Trottle sat on sometimes by mistake and a hunting lodge in Scotland where he went to shoot deer and a beach house in the south of France with a flat roof on which Mrs Trottle lay with nothing on so as to get a suntan which was not a pleasant sight. Ugh. But there was one thing they didn't have. They didn't have a baby. As the years passed and no baby came along Mrs Trottle got angrier and angrier. She glared at people pushing prams. She snorted when babies appeared on television gurgling and advertising disposable nappies. Even puppies and kittens annoyed her. Then, after nearly ten years of marriage, she decided to go and adopt a baby. First, though, she went to see the woman who looked after her when she was small. Nanny Brown was getting on in years. She was a tiny, grumpy person who soaked her false teeth in brandy and never got into bed without looking to see if there was a burglar hiding underneath. But she knew everything there was to know about babies. You'd better come with me, Mrs Trottle said, and I want that old doll of mine. So Nanny Brown went to fetch the doll, which was one of the large old-fashioned ones with eyes that click open and shut and lace dresses and cold china arms and legs. And on a fine day towards the end of June, the chauffeur drove Mrs Trottle to an orphanage in the north of England and beside her in the Rolls Royce sat Nanny Brown, looking like a cross old bird and holding the china doll in her lap. They reached the orphanage. Mrs Trottle swept in. I have come to choose a baby, she said. I'm prepared to take either a boy or a girl, but it must be healthy, of course, and not more than three months old, and I'd prefer it to have fair hair. Matron looked at her. I'm afraid we don't have any babies for adoption, she said. There's a waiting list. A waiting list? Mrs Trottle's bosom swelled so much that it looked as if it was going to take off into space. My good woman, do you know who I am? I am Lorena Trottle. My husband is the head of Trottle and Blatherspoon, the biggest merchant bank in the city, and his salary is £500,000 a year. Matron said she was glad to hear it. Anyone lucky enough to become a trotter would be brought up like a prince, Mrs Trotter went on. And this doll which I have brought for the baby is a real antique. I have been offered a very large sum of money for it. This doll is priceless. Matron nodded and said she was sure Mrs Trotter was right. But she had no babies for adoption and that was her last word. The journey back to London was not a pleasant one. Mrs Trottle ranted and raved. Nanny Brown sat huddled up with the doll in her lap and the chauffeur drove steadily southwards. Then, just as they were coming into London, the engines began to make a nasty clunking noise. Oh no, this is too much, raged Mrs Trottle. I will not allow you to break down in these disgusting squalid streets. They were close to King's Cross Station and it was 11 o'clock at night. But the clunking noise grew worse. I'm afraid I'll have to stop at this garage, madam, said the chauffeur. They drew up by one of the petrol pumps. The chauffeur got out to look for a mechanic. Mrs Trottle in the back seat went on ranting and raving. Then she grew quiet. On a bench between the garage and a fish and chip shop sat a woman whose frizzy red hair and long nose caught the lamplight. 
She was wearing the uniform of a nursery nurse and beside her was a baby's basket. A basket most finely woven out of rushes whose deep hood sheltered whoever lay within. The chauffeur returned with a mechanic and began to rev the engine. Exhaust fumes from the huge car drifted towards the bench where the red-haired woman sat holding onto the handle of the basket. Her head nodded but she jerked herself awake. The chauffeur revved even harder and another cloud of poisonous gas rolled towards the bench. The nurse's head nodded once more. Give me the doll, ordered Lorena Trottle and got out of the car. For eight days, the nurses had waited on the ship as it anchored off the secret cove. They had sung to the prince and rocked him and held him up to see the seabirds and the cliffs of their whole land. They had taken him ashore while they paddled and gathered shells and they had welcomed the people who came through the gump as they arrived in the mouth of the cave. Travelling through the gump takes only a moment. The suction currents and strange breezes that are stored up there during nine long years have their own laws and can form themselves into wind baskets into which people can step and be swooshed up or down in an instant. It is a delightful way to travel but can be muddling for those not used to it and the nurses made themselves useful helping the newcomers onto the ship. Then, on the ninth day, something different came through the tunnel, and that something was a smell. The nurses were right by the entrance in the cliff when it came to them, and as they sniffed it up, their eyes filled with tears. Oh, Lily, said poor Violet, and her nose quivered. Oh, Rose, said poor Lily, and clutched her sister. It was the smell of their childhood, the smell of fish and chips. Every Saturday night, their parents had sent them out for five packets and they'd carried them back warm as puppies through the lamplit streets. Do you remember the battle, batter, all sizzled and gold? asked Lily. And the soft whiteness when you got through to the fish, said Violet. The way the chips went soggy when you doused them with vinegar, said Rose. And as they stood there, they thought they would die if they didn't just once more taste the glory that was fish and chips. We can't go, said Lily, who was the careful one. You know we can't. Why can't we? asked Rose. We'd be up there in a minute. It's a good two hours still before the closing. What about the prince? There's no way we can leave him, said Lily. No, of course we can't, said Violet. We'll take him. He'll love going in a swoosherette, won't you, my poppet? And indeed, the prince crowed and smiled and looked as though he'd like nothing better. Well, to cut a long story short, the three sisters made their way to the mouth of the cave, climbed into a wind basket, and in no time at all found themselves in King's Cross Station. Smells are odd things. They follow you about when you're not thinking about them, but when you put your nose to where they ought to be, they aren't there. The nurses wandered round the shabby streets, and to be honest, they were wishing they hadn't come. The pavements were dirty, passing cars splattered them with mud, and the Odeon cinema where they'd seen such lovely films had been turned into a bowling alley. Then suddenly, there it was again, the smell. Stronger than ever now, and beside an all-night garage. They saw a shop blazing with light, and in the window, a sign saying, Frying now. The nurses hurried forward, then they stopped. We can't take the prince into a common fish and chip shop, said Lily. It wouldn't be proper. The others agreed. Some of the people queuing inside looked distinctly rough. Look, you wait over there on the bench with the baby, said Rose. She was half an hour older than the others and often took the lead. Violet and I will go in and get three packets. We're only a couple of streets away from the station. There's plenty of time. So Lily went to sit on the bench and Rose and Violet went in the queue. Of course, when they reached the counter, the cod had run out. Something always runs out when it's your turn. But the man went to fetch some more and there was nothing to worry about. They had three quarters of an hour before the closing of the gump and they were only ten minutes' walk from the station. Lily, waiting on the bench, saw the big Rolls Royce draw up at the garage, saw the chauffeur get out and a woman with wobbly piled up hair opened the window and let out a stream of complaints. Then the chauffeur came back and started to rev up. Oh dear, I do feel funny, thought Lily, and held on tight to the handle of the basket. Her head fell forwards and she jerked herself awake. 
another cloud of fumes rolled towards her, and once more she blacked out, but only for a moment. Almost at once she came round and all was well. The big car had gone, the basket was beside her, and now her sisters came out with the three packets wrapped in newspaper. The smell was marvellous, and a greasy ooze had come up on the face of the Prime Minister, just the way she remembered it. Thoroughly pleased with themselves, the nurses hurried through the dark streets, reached platform 13 and entered the cloakroom. Only when they were safe in the tunnel did they unpack the steaming fish and chips. Let's just give him one chip to suck, suggested Violet. But Lily, who was the fussy one, said no. The prince only had healthy food and never anything salty or fried. He's sleeping so soundly, she said fondly. She bent over the cot, peered under the hood, unwound the embroidered blanket, the lacy shawl, and then she began to scream. <gasps> Instead of the warm, living, breathing baby, there lay a cold and lifeless doll. On the wall of the gentleman's cloak room was moving, moving. It was almost back in position. <gasps> Weeping, clawing, howling, the nurses tried to hold it back. Too late. The gump was closed and no power on earth could open it again before the time was up. But in Nanny Brown's little flat, Mrs Trottle stood looking down at the stolen baby with triumph in her eyes. Do you know what I'm going to do? She said. Nanny Brown shook her head. I'm going to go right away from here with the baby to Switzerland for a whole year. And when I come back, I'm going to pretend that I had him over there, that he's my very own baby, not adopted, but mine. No one will guess. It's such a little baby. My husband won't guess either if I stay away. He's so busy with the bank, he won't notice. Nanny Brown looked at her thunderstruck. You'll never get away with it, Miss Lorena. Never. Oh, yes, I will. I'm going to bring him back as my own little darling babbikins, aren't I, my puppet? I'm going to call him Raymond. Raymond Trottle. That sounds good, doesn't it? He's going to grow up like a little prince and no one will be sorry for me or sneer at me because they'll think he's properly mine. I'll sack all the servants and get some new ones so they can't tell tales and when I come back it'll be with my teeny weeny Raymond in my arms. You can't do it, said Nanny Brown obstinately. It's wicked. Oh, yes, I can. And you're going to give up your flat and come with me because I'm not going to change his nappies. And if you don't, I'll go to the police and tell them it was you that stole the baby. <gasps> you wouldn't, gasped Nanny Brown. But she knew perfectly well that Mrs Trottle would. When she was a little girl, Lorena Trottle had tipped five live goldfish onto the carpet and watched them flap themselves to death because her mother had told her to clean out their bowl and she was capable of anything. But it wasn't just fear that made Nanny Brown go with Mrs Trotter to Switzerland. It was the baby with his milky breath and the big eyes which he now opened to look about him and the funny little whistling noise he made. She wasn't a particularly nice woman, but she loved babies and she knew that Lorena Trottle was as fit to look after a young baby as a baboon. Actually, a lot less fit because baboons, as it happens, make excellent mothers. Where's the baby? Oh, I think that's the doll actually, isn't it? In the basket. <gasps> da, da, da. Kidnapped. So, Mrs Trottle went to Switzerland and over the island a kind of darkness fell. The Queen all but died of grief. The King went about his work like a man twice his age. The people mourned, the mermaids wept on their rocks and the school children made a gigantic calendar showing the number of days which had to pass before the gump opened once more and the prince could be brought back. But all of this, the boy called Raymond Huntington Trottle knew nothing at all. Here we go, and there's chapter three. Right, well, I hope you enjoyed chapter two and we'll do chapter three tomorrow. Bye.